So I'm so happy to have Kate Hine here with us today. Kate's a principal consultant at Maya De Geophysics with over 20 years experience. She's made several major discoveries using geophysical methods. So it's going to be amazing to have her share a little bit of that knowledge with us today. It's going to be a fun session. We've got some live polls coming up during the talk. Please get involved. You can answer anonymously. But yes, let's all have a bit of fun. And thank you so much, Kate. All right, so today we have 30, 40 minutes. It's not enough time to give you really much useful information about how electrical geophysics works. It took me five years to realize I didn't know anything about electrical geophysics. So um, I would say that I didn't even try that hard to try and explain it all to you in this presentation. What I tried to do is explain to you what you needed to be able to do to use electrical geophysics, how to integrate it into your exploration program. So today's angle is just really a very, very basic uh, geophysical synopsis, if that makes sense, of what EM and IP are. And then we actually go through a couple of works examples. And that's where the fun bit, I think, it's a bit of an experiment. You guys get to um, sort of help me make the decisions. Ultimately, I make the decisions, but we, we all get to contribute to the decisions and we can, and that will let us discuss the different sort of angles away and how things could have could or couldn't have happened. So for these various discussions. So this is um, my company and John Bishop. So we founded MITRE Geophysics in, um, John founded MITRE Geophysics in 1980. We are based in Tasmania and Brisbane and Perth. And, um, and we've been basically consistently advising the exploration industry since then, so skip that part. Now, I notice there's a few geophysicists in this audience. I don't really need to explain to them why geophysics, but the fundamental reason we use geophysics is because we can't just drill everywhere. It's too slow, it's too expensive. And so we use geophysics to reduce the size of our area that we're looking at. So realistically, an ore deposit isn't just a needle in a haystack, it's a needle in a lot of haystacks. So it's a very difficult thing finding an ore body. And if you can use any way of sort of reducing your earth volume down to something that's more achievable, then uh, geophysics is it. So basically the way I see it and the way I see really experienced, the, the really experienced exploration managers I work with, and I'm talking the ones with 15 years plus experience, they all have a really, I almost think it's formulaic approach. And the first thing they really ask themselves is, does my target, is it likely to have an appreciable physical property contrast? They don't use necessarily use those words. They might just think, oh, do I, do I reckon I should do EM here? And they often, you know, might not even know the answer to that, but they know to ask the question, does it have an appreciable physical property con contrast? If, it, if it's likely to be more or less conductive, then you consider, consider doing um, EM. Or if it's more or less magnetic, then you can look for magnetite destruction or magnetite alteration, then obviously a good mag survey would help. Density contrast, gravity, if it's more chargeable, stores electricity better than the surrounding rock, then that's somewhere, it's a type of situation where you might use IP. And then the next thing they do, if they decide that maybe geophysics might have an op, like an application in their project, is they um, they talked with an experienced and impartial geophysicist, and they really understand how the geophysics industry is structured. We normally, generally speaking, the industry is separated into people who provide advice. So they're either company geophysicists or consultants like me, and then you have people do data acquisition and processing. So they're sort of contracting companies. And the reason for that is to have this separation of interest. So my interest is in finding ore deposits and I don't care which method I use. I want to use the best method for that particular ore deposit. For a contracting company, if they primarily do EM then it, and you ask them what sort of geophysics they should do, then they've got a bit of a bias towards doing one particular or another. So that's, you know, they're not impartial. They've got their own equipment. They've got their own crews. So we separate it into the people who provide advice and make recommendations versus the people who do data acquisition. And it avoids that fox looking after the hen house problem where you have, um, you know, the person in charge of telling you how good your data is, is also the person who um, actually acquired the data, then that's a conflict of interest. 
So, and any geophysicist who's had enough experience should be able to concisely define in words that you can understand what a potential survey could realistically be expected to achieve. So if something just seems too good to be true and has just amazing what it can do, then probably your geophysicist either is either a chronic optimist or um, maybe isn't that expert at what they're actually talking about. So really, as a good exploration manager, it's finding that person that you can trust who is impartial and that can provide you advice. Geophysics is too broad a, um, a, a field to, to, um, to basically go straight in and try and learn it all yourself. You engage people who are experts in it. And even I will say that people will approach me about projects and I'll just say, look, I'm not the right person for that project. I don't actually know that much about that particular sort of geophysics. I've heard this, this other person over here, they're much better. They've had a lot more experience, go that way. So it's about finding someone who's impartial and willing to say, I don't know as well. So, and then the last thing, and this is probably the most crucial step that these, these really expert exploration managers have is this really in-depth discussion and that we talk about, we talk through and we talk through what is, what, why do you think we should do this particular approach for my target? What do you reckon the timing would be? How much is it gonna cost? Now, and this is a big one, what is the depth or radius investigation? What do you think the resolution and uncertainty is? So that's a really hard one to get a, a real, it's, it's hard to get a real gut feel for what the resolution and uncertainty is. So someone who can explain that to you um, is, is quite, quite useful. Um, what will the results look like? When will I get them? What are the risks of this particular approach like? Well, we don't know if it's gonna work in this area because there might be lots of conductive overburden. We don't know if there is or not. So. So that, that conversation, it's a very wide ranging conversation and it, it needs to be really a sit down and talk through with lots of information. And often includes having a bit of a review of what existing geophysics has already been done on a project. So that's the really the basics, basic start for any project is those things. So today I am focusing on some examples illustrating that process. But first I have to give you some really basic fundamentals of EM. MMR and IP, which are the electrical methods that I'm chiefly involved with. So each of those methods, EM method, for example, is lots of different geophysical methods under that one. And, um, but I'll give you the, just the, the real basics of it. So how does EM work? Um, how does MMR? So EM is a giant metal detector. That's really all it is. Now, this particular example I've got here, it's a downhole EM survey. So we have our transmitter loop that is transmitting an electromagnetic pulse. The way it generates this electromagnetic pulse has got, is it's got an electrical current flowing around the transmitter loop. And that current has a magnetic field. And the laws of electromagnetism is whenever that current changes, you get a changing magnetic field. And changing magnetic fields induce electrical currents in anything conductive around them. So they induce electrical currents in the ground. They, they, conduce, they, don't, um, they induce electrical currents in your car over here. And they also induce electrical currents in an ore body, which is what these little blue lines are here. So we get a pulse from our changing current here, causes a magnetic field pulse. And that causes secondary currents to be induced in this little ore body. Now, if you have your receiver down a drill hole and map the shape of those secondary magnetic fields, that's called downhole electromagnetics. You use the same receiver, but walk it along the surface, with, but leaving your L, um, EM loop in place, then that's called fixed loop electromagnetics. So downhole electromagnetics is just fixed loop electromagnetics with, with the receiver going down the hole. If you move your transmitter loop along at the same time as moving your receiver along, then that's called moving loop EM. And guess what? If you take the whole bunch and stick it beneath a helicopter or a plane, it's called airborne EM. So they all rely upon exactly the same physical principle. What happens when you change the configurations is you get different abilities to see to different depths and with different resolution. Because what happens is when you, for example, sling this whole bit beneath, beneath a plane at flight 100 kilometers per hour, you're obviously not gonna have quite the same ability to see subtle things as you are when it's not sitting nice and still on the ground and not bouncing along. So Airborne EM has about 10 times to 100 times the noise level of ground, or EM, ground EM, and ground EM has about 10 to 100 times the noise level of downhole EM. 
So you can often achieve, like for example, the um, the, the Bentley ore deposit isn't detected with, with ground EM, even though it's a lovely massive sulfide ore deposit, in which case it's definitely not detectable with airborne EM, but downhole EM works a treat, maps, maps, the, order, maps the lenses to a, a, an amazing extent. So the application of the EM really depends on not just whether it's a conductor or not, but also how you intend to use it. I think there's our secondary fields getting back by a receiver. So one thing I like to do is I imagine the EM fields generated by this transmitter loop, this square. So imagine a cross section through this loop and that's this cross section here. And there's our two little loop wires. When the transmitter is turned off, it's basically like someone blowing a smoke ring. And this is a cross section through our smoke ring. So transmitter is turned off at this point here. And then after a little bit of time, our smoke ring goes out and that's at early time. And then at mid time, it, it extends further out. And then at late time, it extends further out into the ground. And so that's what our receiver sees. We see this at early time, it's to get a high amplitude because you're close to the, to the loop and then gradually gets weaker and weaker as, as the smoke ring diffuses. And that's what the electrical currents in the ground are doing. So I just always imagine my little transmitter middle loops is going poof, 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 as the system flies along or with airborne lamb going poof and then an hour later as they do the next reading, poof, as they do the next reading. So it's, it's the, the smoke ring is quite a common, commonly used uh, analogy for how the EM fields actually behave in the earth. Now, in this case, we've just got an earth and the EM fields are just fusing out into the earth. There's nothing stopping them. Now, if we have a massive sulfide ore body, they get trapped. And you might've heard the words confined conductor. Sometimes we say there's a confined conductor. Well, that's might not be immediately obvious, but that is a good thing in EM if you see a confined conductor because our EM fields will just diffuse out into the earth, nothing's trapping them. But when you've got something really high conductivity like this little shape plate right there, they actually get stuck in that plate. And so the rest of the ones decay away and they disappear. The smoke ring just disappears off except for these little ones that are stuck in the confined conductor. And they're the ones and they stay around. And, they, and the, the length of time that they stay in this confined conductor depends on the conductance of that target right here. And so that's one of the reasons we hate conductive overburden is because these other fields stick around for so long that we don't ever really get a chance to be able to discriminate the fields that are just stuck in this little ore body from the background host response as much. So it suddenly becomes much harder to actually understand what's going on. So it's, um, that's when, when we're complaining about some conductive overburden, that's why. So this is an example of an applied version of, of, of EM. And it's really, these days, EM is used so much in nickel that it doesn't even, they don't even bother to report it. It's just, I'm a, a so like assumed that there would have been EM on any exploration holes. So on this particular hole, there's a, um, that looks like a surface hole. It's apparent, they've, they've drilled it, they've got nothing in the hole. So they do downhole EM. And this style of response here is, indicates an off-hole anomaly. So the cross components, which is the U component and the V component, they give the direction to the ore zone and the general shape and width of it gives the distance and size. So there's our little conductor, 50 by 50 metres. It's about 20 metres off the hole. And that's pretty magic, being able to drill a hole, miss it entirely, and then hit, hit it with the next hole. That's, you can, it's a basically sells itself, downhole EM in this particular application. I have had one downhole EM survey where we missed the drill, missed the ore deposit by 300 metres with the hole, and we were able to discover where the source was by doing downhole EM. The only reason that was possible to see it 300 metres away because it was a ginormous, but absolutely huge conductor. Generally speaking, the, the, the range of investigation is sort of um, about 100 to 150 metres for a plate approximately proportional to the distance of hole. So at 150 metres, you could see a plate that was 150 by 150 metres, but you wouldn't see one that was 50 by 50. So the, the size, the range of investigation depends on the size of the target. Next hole drilled right through the middle. You've done another EM response and you get this lovely strong EM peak, which is typical of an intersection type response. 
So why do we like extra, extra electromagnetics? I should be able to say that probably. It's the sharpest tool in the exploration geophysics box. Um, yes, it's effectively a giant metal detector. And yes, there's lots of caveats to that. But airborne EM in particular can cover a huge area very quickly. The usual cost is about $150 to $250 per line kilometre. So incredibly, incredibly cheap. And you know, it's a great way to sort of jag in a discovery. There might be something there and you just happen to get a line over it. And obviously, uh, you know, the, the case for doing downhill EM for nickel, for example, um, speaks for itself in the previous one. So why would you not use EM? In some areas, there's incredibly conductive overburden. And unless your target is sufficiently conductive that you can see past the conductive overburden, it can become very difficult to actually delineate a basement feature from this very conductive overburden. Sometimes in certain prospects, you have a lot of graphitic shales. So you get lots of EM conductors and most of them are graphitic shales. Um, but normally speaking, I find that you can discriminate one from the other. And lastly, if it's a low conductivity or a disseminated target is not a target for EM. And if there's too much man-made stuff on surface, like fence lines, like, sorry, fence lines, pipelines, power lines, all that sort of stuff can really stuff up airborne or surface EM. But often you can still do downhole EM in that situation. So this is MMR. I mention it not because it's a particularly common technique, because it has a certain niche where it can be quite effective. And that's the case where you have long ribbon-like conductors that aren't particularly good targets for EM, strike extensive ribbon-like conductors. And they, these are often uh, sphalerite-rich type things. And, um, and sphalerite generally is not a good target for EM. And MMR is able to resolve the response from a weaker conductor where EM, the actual source, needs to be, in, in an absolute sense, just a good conductor. And MMR, it doesn't, just needs to be better conductor than the host rock. So that's MMR. My, one of the best MMR surveys I was involved with is we, um, this is the North Mine at Broken Hill. And so we had three, two lenses. This is the three lens and the two lens. And they're both massive leds in sulfur. Like, EM conduct the beautiful EM conductors, huge ore bodies. I mean, it's the North Mine of Broken Hill. Don't need to say anything more. Huge. Um, but the target was this narrow uh, sea lens position, which is like a sphalerite rich low that had never had much attention. But now there's, at this point, the zinc price was through the roof. So the question was, maybe we can, um, maybe we can make something out of this ore zone above the, the, main, the main lead zinc sulfide part. Anyway, um, the difficulty with drilling was these are 400 meter holes and you're drilling pretty at a very ribbon light that would go up and down stratigraphically, very hard to target and, and drilling at a low angle to it. So it was a pretty difficult um, drilling target. So we did MMR and resolved basically where the ore zone was on each drill section <coughs> to a high level of accuracy. And in this case, we actually use a downhole ele negative electrode to better energize the, the just to energize this zinc stuff while ignoring this, um, this two lens and three lens. Otherwise, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to see the forest for the trees, but this is a perfect way to just highlight the stuff we were trying to map. So, so how does IP work? So IP is um, basically a polarization effect. And what it does is when you apply electrical current to the ground, little ions, <coughs> which are normally just spread out in a homogeneous state, they polarize. So the negatives go one way and the positives go another. And when you take away that voltage, and literally the way you apply the voltage is you stick two electrodes in the ground, a positive and negative, and then stick a battery, or in our case, a big transmitter between them, and that will polarize the ground. You take that away, and then they go back into their mist around, spread around state. That's, that's all that happens. And when they, go, when they move back into their mist around state, that generates a little voltage, right? So our transmitter turns on, then it turns off. And our, at our receiver here, it measures a little voltage which decays with time. So this IP is literally just between this, over this interval, T1 to T2, the area under this curve. How much voltage is there over time? It's measured, the unit is millivolts per volt or milliseconds. And it, that is literally all it is. And that is the measure of chargeability. So why do we like IP? Because it detects alteration halos, but it's low resolution. 
and it's relatively expensive. Now, why are we interested in alteration halos? Because an ore deposit is a tiny thing, but the old, it's like you can imagine an ore deposit is often the, the, often the fire, but the alteration halo is the smoke. You can find the smoke much more easily than you can find the fire. So yes, it doesn't necessarily find, it's looking for a much bigger target than just trying to, which EM was just trying to find the fire. IP is looking for a much bigger target and not all, all deposits have massive sulfides. For example, porphyry coppers are, um, are largely disseminated sulfides and IP was largely developed to define disseminated sulfides. So if you're thinking IP, think disseminated sulfides. Why would you not use IP? That's because the target is small compared to the depth of burial. I mentioned resolution before. I think if any of you are really interested in using IP, I would strongly suggest that you get your consultant. And I've got some wonderful slides. I won't go through them, but it will show you in a really visceral sense the loss of resolution with depth. So it's absolutely awful. Like the depth, um, the target has to be quite large with respect to the depth of investigation to actually be resolved. The exact width depends on the depth that type of IP used and the, and the actual conduct, conductivity, sorry, the chargeability. But the, um, generally speaking, it's a large fraction of the actual depth of investigation is how big the target needs to be to be resolved. And um, yeah, it's, it's something that I find that probably is one of the biggest areas of misunderstanding is, is um, you know, what sort of size targets can we expect to be seen at what depth? And also sort of the resolution, the ability to resolve two things as separate at depth is um, another thing that is very poorly understood. And it's worthwhile, I think, even as an exploration manager, sitting down and really asking your geophysicist, can you explain or show me some examples of changes of resolution of IP, particularly if you're doing IP with, with, um, with, depth, of, with depth of burial. And that might give you a bit of a, it will probably, well, it will change the way you approach testing IP anomalies. So Steve Collins has seen IP responses down at 1.2 kilometres from known ore zones. I've made discoveries based on IP alone, essentially at 400 and 500 and even 600 metres. But um, so it's quite, and I have, I have to admit that I haven't made a discovery at that depth using EM yet. I've seen lots of EM conductors sort of the 200, 300 metre range, but because IP is looking for a bigger target, that's one of its chief adventures. So that's the summary of EM versus IP kids. So now we're going to do the fun part. We've got two tools because our talk today is electrical geophysics. I am limiting us to projects that heavily relied on electrical geophysics, but we're going to run these projects through in real time. Like it's as if the lease was just awarded to us. You guys are the exploration manager. I'm the geophysicist. Um, it's a little bit of like pick your own adventure um, using Zoom, but it obviously it, we can't quite do it that way. So I sort of end up picking your adventure for you and tell you what the other ways were things that could have been done. So it is done through basically these poles pop up on your, your screen and you get to click which way you would go. Um, I, I'm not really seeing, um, I, I'm sure everyone has a different way of skinning a cat, but um, I don't think it's probably just best to limit to yourself to the options that I put up on the, on the, um, on the screen. Ultimately, there's multiple ways that most of these ore deposits could have been discovered. And um, I basically will have a polling slide and I'll ask you a question. And the polling slides are nominated by this little, little circle at the top left corner. And um, the polling is absolutely anonymous. So we'll just see at the end who picked what, essentially. And some of you might know these case studies or, or um, most of you won't know, but um, one of them, the first one, but the second one you might know because it's relatively well known. And yeah, as I said, there's a lot... Ultimately, for some of these projects, there were multiple ways to get to the answer, but on other ones, there was really only one way we could have made the discovery. So it's an interesting way, I think, and it's a bit of an experiment. I'm using you guys as an experiment to see how, um, how an interactive presentation can go. So this is your exploration manager, and you've just got a brand new, quite large lease. It's about 40 kilometers long. 
in a greenfields area. It's perspective for VHMS and porphyry. And it's not in Australia, third world country. So you're limited, lots of issues with getting equipment and people in and out of the country and things like that. There are several small, it's actually relatively recent GIF, um, VH, uh, sorry, recent sort of seafloor volcanics, recent by us standards anyway in Australia. And there's several nice little VHMSs, one that's mine um, on, your, on your lease, and you've got some world-class porphyries next door. And there's been, there's been a bit of previous work, but all like really small scale stuff. And for some unknown reason, uh, they ran around and done 25 meter dipole dipole IP, like in various sort of random locations, which the effective deformation of 25 meter dipole dipole IP is pretty limited. So it, it's, all, it's all really near surface scratching, basically what's been done. And there's lots of smoke and you've got this huge exploration lease. So, so the first thing you do, of course, is, well, what do I have? And that's a really common question that most projects start with. What data do I have? And um, in this case, I, 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 reviewed, I reviewed the data for you and I found that you've got some, um, uh, that like sort of scrummy little dipole, dipole, you know, IP. It hasn't even had an inversion done on it, this old IP. Lots of little anomalies, but nothing huge, but it's really shallow. And I also say you've got some, a large scale heli geotem, which is like 2000 and, seven era data, it's awful data. It's just, it looks good in a map, like I've shown this map here, but I'm really, um, I have to say that it's effective depth investigation is um, stick out of the ground or 50 to 100 meters below surface. Like this, this is just the worst quality. It was just really early in the development of time, time domain helicopter EM. What do we do next? So should we go through and do another more modern airborne EM survey? Or do we want to get some ground, good geochemistry <clears throat> over the prospective areas to help narrow down the field a bit? Because I mean, this is 40 kilometers long. It's really hard to get airborne EM systems into the country. It's gonna cost a lot of money. Um, my, there's a high likelihood you're gonna to have to pay someone under the table to get the equipment out of the country as well. Um, maybe go straight in with ground geophysics, but geez, it's a huge area. Where do we start? So you guys can vote now if you like. Yeah, so it's too, it's too hard. I mean, I, like one thing I tell you as an exploration manager is, is, is EM works quite well, except for the issue that we can't get equipment into the country and there's a lot of like power lines at surface and, uh, and we can't get equipment into the country and there's no conductive overburden, but we can't get equipment into the country. And you're living on a, like, you have a time frame and you don't want it like doing an airborne EM survey over this sort of region would be probably in this part of the world, probably be upwards of a million dollars. So it's it's pretty, like it's a big gamble. Oh, okay. So we get another modern airborne EM survey. Yep, get some geochemistry of some perspective areas. Wow, that's pretty good. Go straight with the ground, ground geophysics. Yeah, the issue with the ground geophysics is it is a gigantic haystack still. We don't even, we don't have a very good idea of where to start. It's 40 kilometers long. So what they decided to do in, in this actual case was go in with the, the geochemistry. It was low risk. You didn't have to worry about getting people or equipment in and out of the country, low cost. And uh, here's the clear. So we do know that our targets have an EM response. Look at that VTEM airborne EM response from a VHMS. So we get this, we decide to go with the geochemistry and we do a couple of patches of geochemistry over areas that look geologically favorable have the right sort of alteration, the right sort of stratigraphy. And um, a long strike from this VHMS obviously is a fairly obvious area and it gets a nice copper anomaly. There's also one in the other one, but this already has a near surface IP. So there's some near, there's, there's small IP anomalies associated with this um, broad copper. But geo geochemistry suffers from the same issue that geophysics is you tend to get stronger responses from shallower things. So the question is, we're not interested in a little one to five million tons VHMS. We want to find a world, world class deposit. Where do we go next? So we've got lovely geochemical anomalies. We've already got IP over this area. So what will we do next? We're looking for a target which is going to be both chargeable and conductive. Um, the issue is, is that a conductive target would be harder to see at depth because it's relatively smaller compared to the actual size of the target where the benefit of IP, it's 
It looks for EM type targets like VHMSs and it also looks for porphyries. So if we've got a porphyry and there's, then we're sort of hedging our bets or maybe we could go out and drill under some of these really good um, geochemical anomalies. So that was, what, what do you think you would do in this case? All right, ground IP. Well, ground IP wins out. Yep. So in this case, if you drill the best geochem, the most of the geochem is, they are spatially associated with where water deposit is, but they're actually not, um, they're more controlled by topography than anything else, actually. So, um, so these ones, for example, up here aren't, aren't related to an ore zone that we can find. But these ones are interesting, but if you drilled them, you wouldn't drill deep enough. So ground EM would, would not have worked in this area because the target, it turns out, we now know, is too deep for ground EM. What we did was ground IP. It wasn't easy though. Look at this bugger. <laughs> okay, IP cable. And the power lines, it's a pretty difficult area for uh, IP. Anyway, this, so this is our IP results. We've got um, a bunch of IP anomalies. That's what happens when you do IP is you get IP anomalies. This large, huge response along the southern boundary is, is this area is peridotite over here. And peridotite often, there's lots of serpentinite and disseminated sulfides associated with peridotite. We, we, we don't need to, we're not looking for peridotite. We don't need to drill this anomaly. But you've got some IP anomalies, so guess what? You drill holes at IP anomalies. And in the end, we've um, had managed to swing with management a budget. We didn't test this one here because it's already got holes into it. They just found lots of disseminated pyrite. So we managed to swing with management eight holes. You can see the whole depth here. They're named by um, their depth. So we're 550, 577, you know, seven. This, I don't know, you guys probably know how much this program costs better than me. But um, this program costs, you know, I would have thought of several few hundred thousand dollars, I would think, to drill this many holes, particularly in the difficult sort of country that it's in. And guess what? These holes find disseminated pyrite. So here's the holes in 3D, and you can see sort of a amount of pyrite down the hole and showing where the hole hits the um hits the IP response and basically you get in the holes that drill IP responses, disseminated pyrite. It's a fairly good correlation. We found pyrite, yay, you know, and that's really often what you'll get when you drill IP, right? So what do we do? The question is what now? We've got eight holes, we've spent how many hundreds of thousands of dollars um, targeting this area? Do you want to, um, let's zoom out again and look at the, the bigger picture again. Like for example, the nice looking copper normally to the north that only had shallow IP. Maybe there's something a bit deeper under that that we could go look at. Or do you reckon you could swing it past um, management to do more downhole, like do downhole EM on the drill holes? Um, the geophysicists recommend you should do the downhole EM, um, but it's pretty hard pill to, pill to swallow. We just spent all this money on the geophysics and now you're asking for more money to be spent on the geophysics, right? So um, let's, or maybe we should go back out and do some, as I said at the start, bring in that big airborne EM survey or do some more regional geochemistry or something like that. There's no, there is no clear answer here, but there's only one that leads to finding an ore deposit. Oh, wow, you guys are legends. <laughs> All right, so that's good. That's what you do. And that's what we did for this project is we, despite having um, just found a bunch of pyrite, the, what I said in my report was that the issue um, with that is we don't know. We've just drilled the smoke. We haven't found the fire. These deposits could be quite small. The drill spacing is much, 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 much larger than the actual size of the deposit. You need to do downhole EM to extend the rate search radius because if there's a VHMS one, near one of these, holes that will find it and we knew that because we knew that the existing VHMS has produced good EM responses in this area. So um, I proceeded to cover myself in glory yet again because when the EM crew arrived, all the holes were cased, when the EM crew arrived all the holes were blocked. So I would have thought that um, by this stage my name was mud because um, basically we'd spent all this money drilling geophysical results and now they just spent all this more money bringing the geophysical crew in and we didn't get anything. So um, 
what ended up happening was we did the downhill AM and we got ended up getting about halfway down most of the holes. This hole's a brilliant success over this side because they've got steel casing in that one. So I don't know why we even bothered with that. But um, this hole here, it's a bit hard to see in this presentation. We did manage to, they washed out, basically flushed out all the clay that was blocking the holes. So we got sort of halfway down it. It shows an increasing EM response at depth. I did a model for that EM response. And I give you a model and it's basically in my report, I say there's a ginormous conductor. The hole has intersected, my report to you goes something like it has an enormous conductor at the end, but the hole is intersected. The size of the conductor is about 400 by 400 meters. But we can't true the true size because EM literally can't see any further than that. So your downhill EM server isn't giving you any information. Your hole has intersected it and it's got about five meters of massive pyrite at the bottom edge. Now, I say in my, and I do try to make the point that an EM conductor isn't tested until you've drilled the middle of it. So this is what the EM results look like. In, in signal increasing with depth. We only got about halfway down the hole. But where the hole intersects it, it does get about five meters of massive pyrite. And these guys, they read the report and they kept on drilling. This hole was collapsed at 450 meters, so they had to start again. The exploration manager on this project um, had to sort of find money from other areas because it wasn't considered a particularly high profile target, this EM response at, at four, depth to the top for this thing is 400 meters below surface. So got to be huge if it's going to be anything. Next hole finally intersected it, but a bit deep. So five meters at 2% copper. And then they did the, th the third and the final hole, which tested it. So this is the, um, this is the final sort of the intercept, the discovery, discovery um, hole, if that makes sense. So this is a long section looking now. So there, there are our holes that we just drilled, but now we're in long section. Did a bunch of downhole AM to delineate the extents of the ore zone. So that's this group of conductors. That's 800 meters strike extents, and that gives us a 15 mil at the thickness of it, thickness of this section of the ore zone, 15 million tons. We did another IP survey. It delineated a huge IP response along strike. Drill hole on that. Really, really, I'm having deja vu to the previous drill hole. Huge response increasing as the hole gets closer. But look at the depth, 840 metres below surface. So deep. So the depth to top for the original discovery is 400. Now we're down at about 1,000 metres. They didn't quite believe me, so we surveyed the hole twice. Once when it was at 840 and once when it was 940. So look at the response now. It just keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger, indicative of an intersection response. And now this is the entire strike length. It's over two kilometres and um, it's probably close to, you know, it's much, much, much more than 15 million tonnes, put it that way. So, and it's basically solid, massive sulphides. And remember, we had a heli geotem survey. This is a two kilometre long, solid, massive sulfide or body, with, which is highly conductive. EM can see it from 300 metres away, right? Downhill EM can. Heli geotem doesn't even give the barest hint that it exists. So that's the um, full extent. You know, that gives you an indication of the differences that can be achieved with airborne versus ground versus downhill EM. So thanks to Martin for his um, expertise, patience. And really, he, it was a foresight. He made all the right decisions at every single point along this um, process, and that led, led to this discovery. You know, he drilled my EM conductor. He did the downhole EM. We did the IP, everything like that. Uh, also, Sid Visser has some really innovative downhole EM equipment, which makes it possible to survey these highly unstable holes, and it would, we wouldn't have got the downhole EM data without that, without that equipment. And finally, John Bishop and my colleagues at MITRE. So, so this second one is a bit more well-known. It's in Australia. Um, you have just been awarded a new bit of ground about 100 metres south of Coba, the 100 kilometres south of Coba. The license contains significant gold workings, including a recently closed mine, and is close to other Coba deposits and right next to a major highway. But you markets are tight. You only have limited time and a very small budget, so about $400,000 excluding overheads so pretty sweet though piece of ground on lots of workings so here show all the workings in this area this area we'll call this area one 
This is the reduced, just the government reduced to pole magnetic starter. You can see it, and this is like a, a nice little, little ore zone. And it's got a bit of historical, well, there's some radiometrics for you, yay. There's another second area over here that has some workings and a, a few drill holes and, you know, we'll call this area two, shall we? So area one, lots of workings, lots of evidence of mineralization. There's a nice gold mine there, nice sort of, that, that's recently closed, but still good. Um, so they're really, what's, what do we, first question is, is our target likely to have an appreciable physical property contrast. So why don't we have a look at what the pre-existing pre -existing geophysics data to answer that question. And the second step is um, to find an experienced and impartial geophysicist. In this case, it was Steve Collins. So let's come up with a plan together. And I'll just give you the information for the first one. So this is a previous a historical IP response. There's obviously a nice little gold deposit. The response is clearly the mineralization produces a nice IP response. And there's an obvious question of does, does, the, does the trend link through to this areas of gold workings? Is there likely to be something more significant at depth associated with these? So it's, it's not a huge surprise, um, probably not a great mystery. What do you think happened next? All right, so he gets, yay, <laughs> that's, that's a rise. So what, what they did, and so this is the, the new extended one. So they, they simply merged the old data and they put it together and you've got a depth slice here at 150 meters depth. And yes, you've got a big strong response here, but really there's not a huge amount of encouragement. And the IP crew report as you go in this direction, it's getting harder to get really useful data or much good data. So like this is a bit of a target. It's not a wonderful target, really. Um, it's nowhere near strong enough to represent a, an all body. So what next? So what do we do next? We have to um, go back to looking at our magnetics. Let's do a bit of filtering on our magnetics. You can see all the trends along here, a bit of a low in the magnetics there. Is that magnetite destruction, evidence of an alteration system? We sort of haven't found anything in this area, so we'll ignore all that. But this other area over here, that's quite a, that's quite a strong magnet on me. You can't really see in this, um, in this wave producing of displaying it, but it's actually a large depth extensive magnet anomaly. We've got this area over here. What, what next? I don't know. This is the RTP. Oh, yeah, we can see some mag. It looks like some reversely polarized magnetic anomalies. If you, if you swap the color scale, reversely polarized magnetic anomalies show up as being highs. Oh, look at that. So these two things are quite interesting. So new piece of information, the company next door actually is flying this massive airborne EM survey and um, they basically offer you to, sh to share mode costs um, and you can get like an airborne EM survey for, you weren't really planning an airborne EM survey, but you can get one at an amazingly cheap rate. So about, you know, very, very, very cheap price per kilometre without paying mobilisation. So you don't have a huge area. Normally mobilisation is too expensive if you don't have a big area with airborne EM surveys. The minimum cost for an airborne EM survey is usually about $100,000 to $150,000. Like it's like, that's the doesn't matter if you only supply five line kilometers, that's what it's going to cost. But if you can get mobilization built in because there's another server in the area, then it's you're inst instantly at least twenty dollars to $40,000 better off in your budget. So the company needs is what to do next. So we can. We got mag data, we can chase some mag targets. We can run more gravity, more ground EM or IP. Um, problem is, is we've got a giant tenement and there's not actually a huge amount of constraint on where to go with the ground EMRIP, like ground EMRIP for a big project easily starts getting up to the $300,000 mark. So probably couldn't afford to cover the whole tenement. Or we could tag onto the neighbor's VTEM survey for only $30,000. And that would cover about, I've got that wrong, covered about 30% of the tenement for $30,000, I think. More surface geochem or bailout. All right, what do we reckon? Yeah, bang for buck wise, the VTEM survey looks pretty bloody good. I agree. You guys can see the results, I think, as well, can't you? Yeah. So, VTEM survey. We've got this. We fly two areas. I don't show that, that we actually fly this area as well. I mean, why wouldn't you? Look at all these lovely prospects. But this is the area that we're going to focus on now. This area that has some workings, that has some evidence of mineralization, some nice sort of geochemistry. So we fly that area as well. Plus about, 
probably $15,000 for that area and $30,000 for the, the two areas. And we get some VTEM data. So VTEM data isn't actually, we can display it as a grid like this, but that's not really the way you can look at airborne EM data. The way to look at airborne EM data is to look at it in, um, in, in profile form. It's useful to display it in grid form, and I actually do both, but it's important that you can't actually see many of the anomalies in profile, except in profile form. So this is our, remember that big mag anomaly you could see in the regional mag? Well, this is the same, same mag anomaly. This is the channel 20 coil response. Here's the flight path. This is what the actual profile EM data looks like. So you've got conductive overburden over here, then it gets less conductive, and then maybe a little bit of conductive overburden, some conduct weekly conductive overburden over here. Pretty typical looking airborne EM data. Good, good noise levels. Looks like nice data. So here's a bit of fun stuff for you guys. With EM, remember our good, remember our EM fields. Can you tell me where the VTEM anomaly is on these profiles? You geophysicists in the audience aren't allowed to vote. <laughs> All right. The rest of you who haven't looked at EM profiles. Now, a little bit of hints. VTEM data, the early time channels are the top of the profile, and the base and the, and the, and the, uh, the deeper channels are the bottom of the profile. So not deeper, but late time channels, sorry. So late time channels is where our target becomes separated from our overburden response. So the early time and the mid time channels, which are the top high amplitude ones, are the overburden and the host rock. The late time, very simplistically, are our target. So we want to look at the late time channels. So who can see the anomaly? All right, B, well done. What do you have me for, hey? Just... <laughs> You can see it. There were a few geophysicists in the audience. Oh, you know who you are. Yes, that's correct. B, most of you said B, and that is a late time response. Okay. There it is there. So that's that gold, that red star there. This one here is that late time. Interestingly, it's also on, it looks like it's also on a mag anomaly. So that's interesting. Right, and what's this reversely polarized magnetic anomaly? That's interesting. Okay, so we've got a few EM responses. This one in particular is the exciting one. So this is a quick technical thing. We talk, sometimes talk about B field versus coil response. And B field is basically a calculation that highlights better conductors from the overburden. So this is the response in the B field. Oh, so that's the response in the coil. And then when you do a calculation of the B field, suddenly this target sticks out a lot better than what it did in the previous one. So there we go. There it is there. That's a beautiful little anomaly. And that's the same anomaly in coil. It's much, much harder to see. It's still there, but it's much harder to see. So what do we do next? Do we look at the EM amplitudes and images and the, those basically all those things I showed you, can you drill directly from those? Or do you talk to your geophysicists about that and get their input on them? Okay, for those of you who, who did answer the RDI, suggest we could drill the RDI, there's a word of warning. For steeply dipping conductors, EM, uh, an EM response is truly three-dimensional, but the RDI product supplied in, or CDI, RDI, same thing, is actually a one-dimensional transform. So when you apply a three-dimensional response to a one-dimensional transform, you actually get these two peaks. And those two peaks are on exactly on either side of where your ore zone. For in this case, our ore zone is exactly down the middle. So if you drilled either of these peaks, you would not hit the ore zone, okay? If you did downhole EM, you would then see that you drilled a hole exactly parallel to the ore zone. So beware of drilling RDIs or CDIs from, from, airborne, from any form of EM data. The only really, really way to get an accurate drill target is to actually model the response using a plate model. And this is that basically shows that. So from a, from a EM response gives you an exact zero over directly above the ore deposit. So the RDI gives you a blob there and a blob there. And, the, um, and so if you drill the peak of either one of these, you won't miss the target, which in this case is in the middle. And that's and for dipping targets, you can probably drill the peak and hit it. 
but the depth is a bit of a mystery. And also if it's a bit offline, that can be hard to tell. So in general, don't drill it. And there are other artifacts in RDIs and CDIs that we don't talk about. And these are a few of them apparent in the MinView data set. And these artifacts are related to errors in the VTEM data. They're not errors, they're real geological noise, but they're not actual massive sulfide ore deposits. They're related to near surface effects, SPM effects and IP effects that in the model generate these apparently very deep and very attractive looking targets. And particularly in the Kobar region, I know that people are, are looking at drilling things like this. So I would be very, very careful um, drilling anything directly off any of those MinView um, excite sections. So what do we do? We have, we have an airborne EM survey or we can, we have an airborne EM model and your geophysicist in this case, Steve, would have said something along the lines of, we need to confirm it is a real, a real response. So let's do some ground EM. Alternatively, you can just try and drill, like model the VTM directly and then drill. And that is actually sometimes possible, particularly if the response is a strong response and I can often model it and we can have a direct drill target from the VTM. I will usually say either way, I'll say, yeah, this is like, yeah, definitely just model it and drill. Or if I'm not sure that it's a real response or if it's a bit weak or a bit deep, then we'll suggest ground DM. I see a lot of companies will just automatically always do ground DM. I just think that's another way to spend $25,000. It's not always necessary. You don't always need to do ground DM to confirm an airborne EM anomaly. It depends on the strength of it. I think most of you would have selected by now. So we would model or do ground DM, I would say, yes. So in this case, the anomaly is really, really weak. And so if you could have gone, if you, basically I can fit a plate model, fits, it doesn't matter which way I make it dip, it fits the response. So if I made it dip that way, we drill it with this hole and you'd hit it, made it this way, you, you know, it, it would be wrong. The actual dip is towards the West. And so the hole would miss it but um, a hole targeting would probably miss the ore deposit. But then if you did downhole EM, you would have found it anyway. So honestly, you could have done either way. Drill a hole, then do downhole EM or confirm it with ground EM and then, and, then, and then drill it either way. In this case, I think we're running out of time a bit. I had my case study a little bit wrong. And um, unfortunately, it turns out they did this ground EM after they'd made a discovery to look for extensions along strike. But um, Rob only told, told me this about roughly 45 seconds before we started the, um, the conference. So I haven't had a chance to like reorder the things a bit, but this is the VTEM anomaly with the airborne data. And this is the same anomaly mapped out by ground DM data. So you can see the improvement. That's what it looks like in 3D. What actually happened is, um, so we, they drilled, they didn't drill based on this. They did a single line of ground DM. They drilled a hole based on the ground DM and got nothing, like just a little bit of sulfides, like nothing much. So what do you think? Oh, crap. Well, the ground EM says it's there. The airborne EM says it's there. We've drilled it and we haven't got it. So next thing they did is they drilled another hole, this one, up slightly up dip, thinking maybe we just missed it a bit in that direction. Didn't get much there either. Now there's one, well, there is one problem, neither the airborne EM nor the ground EM were ever modeled. So they weren't drilling based on EM models. They were drilling based on sort of rule of thumb of where the target would be based on the shape of the geophysical anomaly. So you've got one last decision, I think. Um, you have drilled two holes and basically got a little bit of sulfides and now it's walk away or keep drilling time okay. or do downhill EM. So what they did is downhole EM. The downhole EM shows a clear, broad off-hole response at about um, 140 metres down the hole. And the width of the response suggests something a long way away, you know, at least, at least 50, 100 metres below the hole. They drilled another hole targeting that plate conductor. But once again, there was no modelling at any point, which is a bit of a flaw in this story. They should, if they'd modeled the data, they would have realized the holes weren't going in straight lines. They're actually strongly curved. And that meant that they weren't testing the bit of ground they thought they were testing. So this hole's curved up, it hasn't hit the target. Another downhole EM shows a much narrower response because you're much closer to the target now. The target hasn't moved, the holes just got closer. Finally, did a fix, we did a fixed loop EM model, remodeled the fixed loop EM now after they'd had three holes, something like that, 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 um, that missed it. And 
basically intersected Malibu. So that was the discovery of Malibu. It was based on uh, a, a, a thirty thousand dollar VTEM survey. So thirty thousand dollars plus plus the cost of four holes and one line of pixel pixel BM was was the um, investment to discover Malibu. And it shows that Airborne EM really is a solid approach for um, finding, like jagging a discovery, if that makes sense. You know, like they sort of had a bit of things going on. There was a sort of a bit of excitement in the area. Let's see. And this is the actual shows you the Malibu ore deposit. And it shows you that fixed loop EM model. I did this model before I got, I did the fixed loop EM model before I got those ore shapes. And it just shows how beautifully it corresponds with the copper zone. It actually maps out the copper zone with the benefit of 2020 hindsight. There's a weaker response from this lead zinc zone here, but you don't really see it compared to this much stronger, stronger response from the copper zone. And that's a really common story with these type of deposits is where you have the copper is where you get the best EM. Was there another way? Um, I think if you drilled quite a few holes targeting mag anomalies, you probably and did downhole E on them, you probably could have discovered Malibu. Um, if you'd done a large scale IP survey, like this big IP survey that was actually eventually done, then, um, and drilled, there was lots of IP responses because a fair bit of puritide alteration in the area. If you drilled the right IP response, then that would have, would have discovered Malibu that way. And um, see, that's a section through the 3D inversion of the mag, I think. So it shows you how it corresponds. MT, magnetotelluris, which is a bit of a buzzword right now. Um, this is actually doesn't produce a really good response in MT because it's relatively short strike length and, um, and then thus, even though it's quite depth extensive and quite a strong conductivity contrast with the so strike, it doesn't give it very much anomaly in MT at all. And if you'd, obviously if you'd done a regional fixed loop BM or moving loop BM, as long as line spacing was tight enough, then you probably would have discovered the order deposit. The strike length is relatively limited, so you couldn't get away with doing for example, 800 meter long spacing because you probably would have missed it. So thanks to Peel Mining for the permission to use the malleable data. Um, sorry for the mistakes that I just found out about. Rob and helping me and explaining a few of the bits I didn't know about and Steve Collins and obviously a fair bit of luck. So conclusions, you don't need, I actually don't think you need to be an expert in geophysics at all. You almost just need what I've showed you. I've just tried to give you the information you need to be. What you need to be more of an expert is, is how to think about geophysics in the exploration process. And that's really what I tried to show you today is how these really successful exploration managers see geophysics in the exploration process. So to get a, it get, gets applied at the right time. It's it's time timeliness. It's budget. It's cost effectiveness. They all they all sync together. Um, knowing what questions to ask really is the you know what geophysical methods are available for my target. What are the pros and cons of each method? Costs and risks, resolution and depth investigation. This is a big one. Try to get as much of a handle as you can on that because I would say if there's anything that people misunderstand is that. They expect either too much from the geophysics or they expect not enough and targets don't get tested because they go, oh, that's probably just noise, that thing. And I'm like, no, 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 this is a, a definite response. Like we should test it. It's just deeper than the other ones, you know? So, and um, so think about your geological exploration model. If you do not expect massive sulfides, EM is probably not a good option. Your target is small compared to its depth. For example, many nickel sulfide deposits, IP might not see it. But you know, so remember that we do we do models of our data, but they are guesses. They are variable and they are very coarse. Don't confuse the model results with the data, but do use them for targeting. All right, thanks, guys. So, yeah, any questions? Happy to talk. So, thank you so much for your time. It was really fun.